final day of debates. I started the recording. Okay, no, hopefully not final date for debates uh, for all of us. Uh, okay, in that case, I will start the debate. Uh, I call upon the first proposition speaker uh, to open the floor for us here. here. Hi, I'm Audible. Perfect. I'll accept your voice in the chat, please, if that's all right. And my speech starts in three, two, one. Panel, the question in today's debate is simple. When Africa freed itself from colonial rule, it had a choice. Prioritize a Western model of democratic statehood or correct the wrongs that those same Western countries had inflicted upon them. Post-colonial leaders chose to imitate their oppressors and Africans have been paying the price ever since. The wording of the motion may be a mess, but Africa didn't have to be. We're very proud to propose. What is our stance on proposition? Four things. First, the clarification issued by the motions committee states that opposition have to defend the world that did exist during the time, i.e. the status quo. To be absolutely clear, this is a world in which much of Africa lives in poverty, exploited by the West, and devastated by civil war. That is the world they must defend. Two, our burden is to defend a hypothetical world in which the majority of post-colonial African states reclaimed stolen land and money from colonial elites and redistributed it among the African population. There are three types of program. A, direct cash transfers to individual people of an amount roughly equivalent to $1,000 in today's money. B, land reallocation, particularly of farmland so that land ownership is allocated roughly equally across the population. And C, this looks like state reclamation of natural resource wealth, like oil wells and regular cash payments to the population of the profits from these. Three, we think that in most cases, a leader of the independence movement would likely become a non-democratic ruler who would initially rule the country on a national level and initiate this policy supported by a network of local community governments. Four, note that this motion covers an entire continent. Given this, we think the burden on both sides is that the policy works for the majority, but not for all countries. Having made that clear, first argument, where would these policies have been done well? Who is carrying out these policies? They are the immediate leaders of post-colonial African states. In almost all cases, these are the leaders of the revolutionary movements in these states, as they were the obvious and only candidates for colonial powers to hand over the reins to. What access would these leaders have been distributing? We think the state would have owned some land and access to begin with, but they would likely have had to take most land off predominantly white colonialists who owned it, or the minority of African land-owning elites who had gained it by collaborating with the colonizers. We think they should have taken this land back without recompense or with relatively tokenistic payments. It was stolen off the people of African states. We accept this might not have been easy and it might have even been violent in a few cases. We think, however, that in most cases, it would have been successful for three key reasons. A, there would have been a lot more Black Africans than white colonialists. By sheer quantity, they clearly win. B, they now control the levers of the state, including the army, so they have much more power. But C, we are supporting a world where many African states chose to do this. This means that even if the first few cases where this policy was attempted were difficult and potentially bloody, white landowners and other African states who saw this would likely have realized their time was up. Given the colonial powers who had just left, neither wanted to see their citizens die, nor themselves get embroiled in conflict, they likely would have paid these white land owners to leave peacefully, as the British did when they left Kenya. Why would these leaders allocate resources fairly? Three reasons. A, they have been literally fighting for their nations and have recent experience of being oppressed. But B, we think their legitimacy at that point in history is heavily hinged on their willingness to fight for the rights of their people. And C, we think a core part of the majority of these independence movements were African intellectuals who were arguing for the justice of this exact policy. Second argument, the principle. We think on the our side, there are three princ powerful principled obligations which the government of the time ought to prioritize and can only be fulfilled by redistributive policies. The first principal obligation is that land and wealth are the correct form of reparation. This land and wealth was stolen by white colonizers whose descendants profited from it, often by enslaving the descendants of its original owners. Not only did the land have significant economic value, it also had unquantifiable cultural value to the people it was taken from. These are historic religious sites or bureau grants. Given that, the criteria for reparations are clearly fulfilled. A, the stolen property itself, i.e. the land, is unambiguous and of immense value. B, 
B, the rightful owner is clear, and C, unless opposition wants to defend colonialism, the illegitimacy of the current owner's possession is also clear. Rather than redress this, opposition requires new states just to shed from the shackles of colonialization to start absolutely protecting the rights of white col colonialists. The second principal obligation is that land and wealth fits with the will of the people. Before colonialism, communities looked much more like those which our redistributive policy would facilitate. Smaller, much more communal, predominantly locally led. Importantly, a lot of independence movement held up this model when they pushed for the end of colonialism. People called for it, they fought for it, they desired it so deeply that men are willing to lay down their lives for it. The third obligation is that land and wealth preserves the right to life and ought to be the most important. Food and money keep you alive. This is what you need to access any of opposition's political rights. Look, we respect that OP has some claim to be granting people rights. But they're obviously far less important than these because A, granting people a right to vote has no guarantee of improving their life, and B, freedom of speech and association are nebulous and are often restricted even in democratic countries. These are of no importance when compared to returning their property, respecting their wishes, and protecting their lives. Before we move on to my third argument, I'll take your peer one. Even if land reparations do occur, how can you assure that individuals have enough capital or even enough land to make a living off of it? Perfect, that's exactly what I'm going to explain in my third argument. Why do we massively reduce suffering and death in post-colonial Africa? Opposition stands for a world where literally millions of people died from preventable poverty because they chose to prioritize Westerners over their people. There are three ways in which we change this. This directly responds to a why when they ask us why this money is so important. First way, money is used to solve immediate issues like food and medicine. This is a simple impact, but it's incredibly important. In our world, people are given money that they can spend on food and medicine. They can, they're given land that they can live on, grow things from, or sell. This allows them to escape extreme poverty. The second way is because they have money to invest. Knowing that you have a regular monthly income from your stake in the local mine, or that you have been able to make savings from your initial payment of cash allows you to invest in the future. A community can collectively buy farming equipment that makes their farm more efficient or invest in a well. The third way is because we give people control over the land. Africa has the potential to grow enough food to feed itself three and a half times over. Despite this, they have suffered more famine than anywhere else in the world. That is because Western companies own their farmland over planted to the point of soil degradation and then sell the crops out of Africa to European buyers. On our side, people control their own land. This improves food security in two ways. A, they farm it in a less commercially aggressive way thus reducing the chances of crop failure. B, they have control over the products that are grown. That means that even if there's a bad harvest or a drought, people are better able to adapt to help themselves. In a reduced harvest, you're able to keep the crops you grow and feed yourself, rather than be forced to sell them to Europe. And even in a truly dire year, you're better able to make the choice to switch to animal agriculture to save yourself, because the land is yours. On a wider level, we think redistributive policies reduce the risk of civil war. Civil wars typically occur when there's a combination of extreme poverty, limited opportunities, and the lack of trust in the state, and are even more likely to happen when there are multiple ethnic groups, who in Africa were often set against each other by colonial powers. Those conditions are why there have been countless civil wars since the end of colonialism, and why there are 21 happening in Africa right now. That's what opposition's policies led to, poverty, weak democracies, and conflict. Why would, why would this be better with redistributive policy? We explain why poverty is, is alleviated, but giving people land gives them stake in their nation. It's much easier to abandon everything for a chance to be a hero, heroic soldier. It's a lot harder when you have a stake in a community. But needless to say, this is about as big as an impact gets. Civil wars wreak untold damage to countries in the long run. This running of the motion may be a mess, but Africa did not have to. We're proud to propose. Thank you. Judges, all set. Excellent. In that case, thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the first speaker side opposition to deliver theirs. Hi, uh, my name is Iga. I'll be the LO. I would, my pronouns are she, her, and I'd prefer POIs in the chat, please. Thank you.
Panel, let me be clear. The Prime Minister has correctly diagnosed that in the last decade, the African continent has been plagued by instability. But there, however, note that this occurred despite the existence of political and civil rights, not because of it. Civil and political rights formed the last stronghold against the attempts at unbridled grabs for power. My speech will be divided into three parts. Firstly, I'm gonna analyze why proposition is unlikely to succeed in their reparations. Secondly, why they're likely to create more economic harms. And thirdly, why we're able to create a more stable society. But before that, I want to make a strategic note. It is not sufficient for proposition to just argue the benefits of reparations. The motion has a flip side, which requires proposition to defend the absence of political and civil rights. In other words, a dictatorship. Because in order to win this debate, proposition has to prove why it is both legitimate and preferable to subject individuals to literal authoritarian rule. Okay, moving on to the first part of my speech on why we think that land redistributions will simply not work. Note that this directly attacks the Prime Minister's first argument on why they think land reparations will be done well. Note that even if the proposition has some fiat to enact their policies, that doesn't guarantee that external factors will make it literally impossible for their policies to succeed. We tell you there are three reasons as to why we are more likely to achieve civil and political rights than they are to achieve economic and land reparations. Operations. Firstly, in terms of international support, when we look at, for instance, assistance for civil and political rights, we've already seen this happening where, for instance, in Senegal, other countries have provided independent observers to ensure elections were free and fair. This is because generally on the international stage, civil and political rights are right, widely recognized. But we say on the flip side, there's oftentimes a lot of backlash for land redistribution. Note that, for instance, the U.S. has sanctioned Zimbabwe for the last 22 years, partly because of their forceful land redistribution policies. Note that this also offsets any economic benefits of such redistribution. The second reason as to why we're more likely to achieve our world is because of the concept of taking versus giving. Land reparations means you have to actively take away someone's assets, which will likely spark aggressive opposition. This is what we've seen in Ghana, where farmers literally hired private mercenaries to protect their own land. Comparatively, civil and political rights are merely given to people, and thus individuals don't have an incentive to fight for what has been taken from them. The third reason here is that there are already blueprints for enshrining civil and political rights. For instance, you can copy existing constitutions and other democratic frameworks. However, land redistribution is such a large, in such large ethnically divided and unstable countries have never been done before. And so it's far more complex to do so. What this means is that it is very unlikely to get economic and land reparations, while it is more likely to get civil and political rights, even if both sides have the same amount of fiat, we have su substantially more external factors that help us. Moving on to the second part now, on why we think proposition is likely to create more economic harm. But before that, I'll take a POI. There are 54 countries in the African continent. Do you think that the US is going to sanction all of these 54 countries and derive themselves of great economic opportunities? Look, like if you look at sort of empirical evidence, the West is more than happy enough to sanction countries that don't follow democratic norms. Like, I, I don't really understand this point. Okay, let's move on to the second part now on why we think that proposition creates more economic harms. We tell you they're likely to have four harms. Firstly, of underutilized land. This is what we meant in our POI, because even if proposition distributes land properly, it is not going to be properly used. And this is for two reasons. A, there's limited capital. So simply giving impoverished individuals land doesn't give them access to economic capital. We saw this in South Africa, where Black farmers couldn't get mortgages from banks, so they still couldn't afford the necessary machinery to work the land. We tell you, secondly, uh, there's oftentimes fragmentation of land. Assuming that land will be distributed equally, you have large plots of land that we split up into many smaller plots. This is seen in Ethiopia, where half of all the plots of land were less than a quarter of a hectare panel that is literally tiny. You cannot live off of that. Note that this threatens food security. When these nations already face food shortages. So every time you waste scarce land that could have been used to grow crops, you bring the countries closer to the brink of starvation. This is also what contributed to the phantom, famine in Ethiopia in 1984 after their land redistribution. The second harm here is you're less likely to have foreign direct investment because foreign companies are reluctant to settle into authoritarian regimes where individuals have absolutely no rights because they're afraid of, for instance, the sanctions. This means that job opportunities are lost in countries that already have high rates of 
unemployment. The third harm here is that you have no development aid because countries are reluctant to give aid to dictatorships. For instance, after the United States made charges of corruption against the government of Kenya, they halted their development aid. This means com communities lose out on hospitals that could have been built. They lose out on schools. They lose out on food, for instance. The last harm here is you're likely to have poor economic policy. And this is caused by the dictator's dilemma. Opposition might give people a bag of money, but if your country has hyperinflation because of economic mismanagement, that money is literally useless. Bad economic policy might happen on either side of the house, but the difference in our side of the house is that when you have political and civil rights, you can correct that. In a dictatorship like propositions world, the people who are critical of the government will never be able to express their critics, uh, their beliefs. Look at Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe literally caused hyperinflation by just continuously printing money and plunging the entire country into economic crisis. What this argument shows you is that even on the metric of the economy, which is propositions grounds, we still take the debate. Know that this also tackles the principal argument because we believe that the best form of reparation is to give back a, the country a stable economy after the disruption and chaos caused by colonialism. They cannot do that. We can. Moving on to the third and last part on why we can create, we can prevent violent conflict. We here, we're going to show you why the lack of civil and political rights will exacerbate conflict and lead to more unnecessary death. Why do we think this is true? We tell you this is for two reasons. Firstly, citizens will turn to violence when they cannot voice their dissatisfaction peacefully. To illustrate in the early 90s, the Nigerian government tried to make a deal with Shell about extracting oil from the Niger Delta. The local communities hated this plan and a small conflict emerged. But because we have democratic structures that recognize the voices of the people, they were able to establish environmental regulations. In Proposition's world, you don't have these rights. You would prevent citizens from being heard entirely. We tell you the small conflict would have escalated to far worse to become far more violent. Island. But secondly, we tell you in propositions world, authoritarian leaders are far more likely to stoke conflict to maintain control. We saw this happening in Kenya in 1992, when the president tried to purposely stoke ethnic conflict to prove uh, to ban opposition parties. Luckily, people were able to hold him accountable, and the president was later ousted from power. On proposition side, they lacked that form of accountability. We tell you ethnic conflicts would have worsened, and many more would have died. Note that this also clashes with their third argument on reducing reducing death and suffering. We tell you, even if initially our world is not a fully functioning democracy at first, enshrining civil and political rights is a prerequisite for that. It is the seed that must be planted before the flower of democracy finally blooms. We tell you that in our world, we are able to create the basis for that. This is because firstly, when you have the right to vote, you're more likely to be able to establish systems of elections. In many African countries, voter turnouts has been comparable, if not higher than in the West. But secondly, we're able to have the established of opposition parties that can organize to pressure government reform. What this ultimately means is that we are the side that is able to maintain stability. We are the side that helps these people. I'm so proud to oppose. Thank you. Great, can everyone hear me? Yes. Whenever you're ready. Uh, well, yeah. Thank the previous speaker and call on the second speaker of Team Proposition. In modern day Namibia, 70% of all land is owned by Namibians of European descent. In Team England, we think it is outrageous that these countries are still in the modern day controlled and owned by the descendants of those who colonized and exploited them. That's why we're so proud to propose this policy today. I'm going to talk about a couple of things in this speech. First of all, I'm going to address the clashes of whether this would have worked, then on principle, then on the practical, and then I'm going to bring a new argument on long term development for the African continent, both economic and political. First of all, some of us. I just want to 
flag like it stuck here, that every single example opposition has given you of failure, of poverty, of terrible conflict that has devastated people's lives and livelihoods happened under their side of the house. We were very clear in our stance that according to the clarification from the motions committee, side opposition's burden is to defend the world as it exists today. They have to defend the status quo. They have to defend what these countries chose to do. That's why when they talk to you about Ethiopia, that's why when they talk to you about Ghana, they have to stand behind the failures there. But then, would this have worked? Because side opposition want to challenge us here. They tried to tell us, first of all, that these leaders are going to carry out these policies badly, and then they tried to say, you're not going to be successful at taking things away from people. How do they respond to this? First of all, on incentives. We believe that these leaders wanted to carry out these policies well. First of all, opposition tried to tell us that these are going to be bad people. We think actually they're likely to be the same on either side, as Helen points out in first, and as we get no response to. Five reasons for this. We think first, they have huge name recognition across the nation. These people are coming off the back of the biggest political win imaginable, independence, so they have popular support. They tend to be very charismatic. That's why these people have risen to the top of the independence movement. They have the infrastructure of the independence movement around them, and that's a ready-made party. And they're the ones who are shaping the discussions of independence, so they have the advantage in rising to the top of any system they create. Whether it's democratic or not, we think these are always going to be pro-independence leaders. And as we also explained to you, we think they are likely to have good incentives for three reasons. First, they want to do what's best for their people. Second, because their legitimacy is hinged on providing for people. And third, ideologically, they are part of the independence movement. They care about these policies. But also, we think on our side, they probably have better incentives because when they see themselves purely as caretakers and they aren't legitimized as full rulers, when you tell these people that they still have to fight for democracy and that fight against colonialism isn't over, we think they're far more likely to be more conscientious about the potential for democratic backsliding and about doing things well. Therefore, we think it's very clear that these leaders are going to have good incentives. Why then are they going to be successful at taking land and money away from the people who own it under side opposition? First, in number, note that there were 23,000 Europeans in Kenya in 1945, compared to 5.2 million Kenyans. We think if the Africans want to revolt, if they want to take away this property from the white Europeans, they're not only justified, they are more than capable of doing so. Second, we tell you that they have the apparatus of the state behind them. And third, we tell you that when all countries are going to be doing this, they will be able to back each other, and white settlers are more likely to leave as soon as they see this is the possibility. We think, therefore, the probability of of backlash is actually very low. We think under our side, it's clear that this is going to be successful. Given that we proved to you then that this is going to be possible, we think if we're able to prove to you that reparations are either principally justified or are practically better than civil and political rights, we think we are clearly able to win this debate. So what does our opposition try to tell us on the practical? They don't really respond to any of our actual analysis on why it is so good to have money, why it's so good to have stability, why this is so good for the economy. They simply give us a set of counterclaims on why they think this is bad. First, on international support, they say their side is better because you're able to have observers to ensure that these processes are free and fair. First of all, under our side, we think it's so much easier because you don't need these observers. You are able to do it once, and crucially on our side, you can't take away those reparations. On their side, democratic backsliding is very easy. Then they try to tell us that the United States is going to impose sanctions. As we point out in the POI, the US isn't going to sanction all these countries. It could only sanction Zimbabwe because there was only one Zimbabwe. But if the whole continent had stood together in pursuing these policies against colonialism, they would have been far more successful. Then they try to talk to us about how it's bad to take away someone's assets. I think we've already dealt with that in the clash over whether this is going to work. Then they try to tell us that the land is going to be underutilized. Their first mechanism for this is that you're not going to be giving people enough money in that. Slightly odd that this is the only argument they could think of against giving people money and land. But how do we respond to this? As we make it very clear in advance, we think when you give direct cash transfers to individual people, and yes, we've done the maths, this looks like $1,000 in today's money, when you're reallocating farmland so that people are able to have a roughly equal share of farmland, and crucially, when you have a stable source of income from natural resource wealth, which we tell you we split among the people of these countries, we think, frankly, that is quite clearly going to be enough to build a living. And it's far better than having absolutely nothing at all, which is the comparative under their side. And then they say, well, you're going to have fragmentation of this land. 
No, again, we preemptively responded to this because we told you about how these groups coalesce into communities and how much better this is than them having absolutely no food or money. Finally, on FDI, don't let the myth of US backed FDI developing African states trick you, panel. The US's FDI in Africa look like building a road in a straight line from a port to a mine. This was never helpful, but as I'm going to prove to you in my speech, even if we get marginally less on our side, what we do get is better FDI. But note also that they gave absolutely no response to our principle, other than saying we have to prove that we're okay with a dictator. We think we've proved to you that these are A, going to be the same people on their side, B, they get dictators on their side anyway, and C, that these are probably going to be people who have good incentives. Why then do we get better long-term development under our side? First, economically. Africa broadly fits two main niches in the global economy. The first is cheap labor. In Ops world, Africans are able to be exploited because they're willing to work for extraordinarily low wages and have no bargaining power to improve their conditions. So Western MNTs are able to exploit them. This led to decades of low wage labor in appalling conditions because their only competitive advantage was the cheap price of labor. And therefore improvements of quality of life came at the unacceptable risk of a company moving out of the country and people starving. But this would have been different on our side because Africa Africans would have had an alternative source of income to fall back on, their land and their livestock, so they wouldn't have been able to be coerced into low-wage labour. And companies would still have invested in these states because they were keeping the resources there, but on our side, it's on far more equitable terms. Secondly, she's is natural resources. Right. Africa is the richest continent on Earth in terms of natural resource wealth. But in opposition, all governments who are trying to protect political rights allowed neo-colonial companies to continue extracting that resource wealth and funneling money back to the West. But in our world, they'd have taken this land back, they'd have extracted and sold the resources themselves, Themselves, and they've used the proceeds to build state infrastructure and crucially to pay cash transfers as we outline. This both makes the state far richer, but also creates consumers who attract foreign investment that is not there to exploit their labor, but rather to sell them goods. Don't underestimate how many billions of dollars this would have funneled into the coffers of African states and the pockets of African people. They're not long-term political development, because opposition wants democratic rights for African states. That's their only argument. If we prove we get this better on our side, we so clearly take this debate already. In a continent of 54 nations, there have been two continuous democracies since decolonization. Right now, Africa contains one full democracy, seven flawed democracies, and 46 states that are considered fundamentally undemocratic. This is because a certain level of economic development is a prerequisite for any democracy to succeed. Two reasons why. First, there's a basic level of education needed for people to learn and understand about the democratic system they're expected to participate in. Second, because you need a level of engaged political class who can put in the time to build political parties and scrutinize government practices. The absence of these conditions is the reason why under the status quo they defend, every African state bar too has failed to successfully have long-term democracy. But on proposition, we think, sure, there would have at some point been agitation for the implementation of democracy. But that transition under our side would have been far more peaceful because as Helen tells you, people in more developed states have so much more to move from war, but it would also have been far more likely to be successful because these countries meet two criteria that we outlined. So on opposition's own metric of democratic rights, we think there would have been far more democracies in Africa today had these policies been implemented. But given that right now there are only eight of them across the entire continent, any more than that wins this debate independently for team effort. We're so proud to propose. Thank you. Uh, I think I briefly dropped there after the end of the speech. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Hopefully the recording didn't. We'll see. Anyway, uh, are judges ready to proceed? Yep. Yep. Excellent. In that case, we thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the second speaker of side opposition to deliver there. Hi, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, okay, great. Um, I'd like POIs in the chat. Other than that, I think I'm ready to begin.
proposition keeps pushing a problem on us, which is that Africa currently, in the vast majority of cases, is not perfect. That is true. But our stance since first has very clearly been that, yes, there are imperfections in, how, uh, in current democracy in Africa, but that is not because of the focus on civil and political rights, it's despite it. The counterfactual would have been significantly worse. It would have fast, had a faster decline to authoritarianism, the re-rolling of good policies, increasing economic mismanagement. This speech is going to be fairly simple. Firstly, I'm going to rebut the claims which come out from opposition. Then I'm going to explain why the two substantive arguments about economics and civil, uh, about uh, uh, economic, uh, economic and land reforms being actively damaging, and about civil and political rights being important in the uh, in the absence of uh, uh, because they help uh, get out of autocracies and because they stop tensions. Uh, you should vote for us. In terms of responses, I'll start with the new addition from the second proposition speaker. They talk about development and that leading to democracy. Two things here. Firstly, note that the claim about development, the long-term development in and of itself, itself, is reliant entirely on their own case of you getting the uh, of you getting these reparations and of these reparations being sufficient enough for you to live off, the, uh, off of them. But secondly, note for development, you don't just need people being able to be economically active. To get development, you need a new income of ca uh, capital. That requires a level of foreign direct in investment. Which no, is what I... the house. No, th uh, no, thank you. And also in the chat, please. But secondly, in terms of the claim of people need security, security to get democracy, and when people are in good economic circumstances, they are more likely to ask for democracies. Firstly, I just like to note that this is empirically untrue. In Saudi Arabia and Chi uh, China, the standard of living is relatively higher or, or significantly higher than a lot of, of individual. A lot of countries in Africa, however, they're significantly less democratic. Also, note that our own case to a large extent already deals with this. But there are a couple of reasons as to why just fundamentally this is not true. Firstly, the moment in which the government is the only thing which uh, guarantees you your income and guarantees your access to your la land, that's when people are more reliant on the government, therefore, they have more to lose. Secondly, people People don't really have that much power of the government on proposition side of the house. You don't have the ability to vote and you don't have the ability to protest. Even if people defy this and start protesting, on proposition side of the house, it's significantly easier for governments to prevent protests from ever getting any kind of steam. This is incredibly important for if we, because if a protest ever wants to achieve anything, it needs to reach a level of critical mass, which requires a huge amount of people to participate in it. So if protests are constantly being put down by autocratic regimes, then you're unable to, even if people have a good quality of living, ever achieve any kind of of change. This is how the CCP maintains a grip, uh, maintains a grip over the uh, people of China. Secondly, in terms of their principal claims, three things here. Firstly, I would like to note that this also hangs on the rest of their case being true. So, so far from proposition, you've gotten two arguments which are impacting of one argument. If we can disprove that argument, then we've won this debate. Secondly, on the idea of, I think this is weighing, where they say land is particularly important because that, uh, there are certain historical places which have unquantifiable value. Firstly, I find it unlikely that a lot of the specifically historical, uh, historically important places are going to be redistributed. We get the impression from the first proposition speaker that this is about farmland specifically. Secondly, even if that is, this is hugely problematic to their case. Surely that would only increase the amount of tensions that you have about the uh, redistribution of land, make it harder to pass and increase the likelihood of wars or smaller scale conflicts. Uh, uh, lastly, we think that it's also like taking away individuals' rights, for instance, the ability to exercise your religion, the ability to exercise your language, is also unquantifiably valued to individuals and their culture. So insofar as we are able to restore these rights better on our side of the house, we think we also restore things of unquantifiable value to individuals. Thirdly and lastly, the lack of, uh, of political power and the ability to self-govern is also what, uh, what was taken away from Africans. It wasn't like the British were just like, hey, y'all, y'all can vote on anything. We're just going to peacefully take away your land. No, it was oppression in any, any, every possible regard. In fact, this was the biggest thing that the Western nation, Western colonial nations took away from Africans. Why? Because this was the root of these all these symptoms with proposition says. So the, uh, taking away land and taking away wealth for, uh, from these countries was a symptom of the fact that they were in a state of oppression. Since we're the side which is more likely to, uh, to allow uh, 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 African nations to achieve, uh, attain, attain some level of democratization, we think we should uh, we should win on this principal idea. But lastly, in terms of the idea of economic and land uh, re reparations being likely, we already have three responses to this. The first was an eager speech about international support. They say, well, you can't sanction every single African country. Um, that's true. But firstly, I find it unlikely that every single African country is going to uh, do, be a backsliding democracy at the same uh, at the same rate. But secondly, I think it is to an extent plausible just because like the USA and the EU trade far more with each other than with African nations or trade, and trade with China far more than they trade with African nations. So in terms of the power 
disparity there, African nations hold relatively little, uh, little importance to, to the economies of Western nations. Secondly, in terms of local influential elite, elite this is also already material from Iga's, uh, Iga's speech in the first argument we give you. They say, well, firstly, in the PM, that they will just peacefully leave after you've attained some victories. Firstly, this is circular re reasoning. It requires you to have attained those victories in the first place. But secondly, I find this incredibly unlikely just because like if Proposition does their research here, they've literally just been war started about what uh, white col uh, colonizers were not wanting to give up their land when it comes to land re redistribution. Like, why would you want to give up everything that you have just because you see other pe uh, people getting, uh, are, are getting it taken away? If anything, we think white colonizers are more likely to want to firstly do exactly what we're talking about, which is abuse the system. I'll take a few in a second, by the, uh, by the way. And secondly, if that's impossible, to fight for it, which is exactly the impact that we're talking about, about civil wars, about conflicts happening. Secondly, they say that Black Africans outnumber white Africans to a significant degree. Firstly, this is a point about political uh, about political po uh, power. We are unsure why the numerical game matters more than the political game, uh, especially since the lo uh, local influential elite, firstly, have the full support of the Western colonizers who've just left behind, uh, behind them. And secondly, because they're the ones with by far the most ca uh, capital. If you want to hire a private militia, then it's not going to be the poorest individuals in Africa, then it's going to be the local elite trying to protect their assets. Thirdly and lastly, this is a new mech here about zero sum. So for instance, if you want to vote, then your ability to vote doesn't detract from my ability to vote. However, if I give you land, then that must directly come up with the land that I, is given to me. So it's relatively easier to implement reforms around civil and political rights than specifically economic reforms, because the amount of land you can get, the amount of wealth which relies in a uh, which is in a country is zero sum. Before I continue, I'm happy to take a POI. You stated at the start of your speech that China and Saudi Arabia are doing perfectly well under authoritarian governments. If that is true, why are political rights necessary under our side? Um, no, we don't think the Chinese and the Saudi Arabian people would be like any or worse off than they would be under a democracy. The point was just more so there are nations in which people have a relatively higher level of prosperity than a lot of African nations, which are still able to operate in, auto uh, in autocracies. Okay, lastly and second, they say that the leaders of these parties wanted to, these countries to do well. Uh, to do well. Firstly, I just find this empirically untrue. Like Mugabe led the uprising against white colonizers and then turned, then turned his reign into a dictatorship in which he deprived uh, Zimbabweans of rights. But secondly, I think there's a more structural reason that we give you. Even if you want to do well, the reality is that you rely on international support and you rely on the influence of local elite, uh, elites. This brings us quite nicely to our own case. Even if you buy everything that proposition gives you, we explain firstly that economic and civil rights uh, or, or economic and land reforms are actually quite bad. Firstly, for food insecurity, because individuals don't have sufficient capital and fragmentation. All they say is, well, we give you the money to buy better equipment and fragmentation isn't really a problem, guys. Panel, we tell you that this is about the comparative. Currently, they're able to produce a lot of food because they have, you have corporate, uh, corporations with huge amounts of capital that they can dump in. On the comparative, you massively reduce the amount of output that you can get. That still causes food insecure, uh, insecurity. All the other mechs, which I won't currently go over, still left standing. Overall, because we're the side which reduces tension, because we're the side which, uh, which prevents economic harm for Africans, you should vote for us. Thank you. We thank the speaker. Ah, sorry. Judges, all set? Yep, yep. Cool. Thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the third speaker with the proposition to deliver their message. Hi, am I audible and visible? Uh, I'll take your eyes verbally, please. <coughs> Colonialism was horrific and unjust for so many reasons, and that's why we began by establishing our principal duty to address those harms. But one of the biggest harms it caused was disrupting the natural development of these states. Throughout history, states have emerged naturally and followed a fairly standard path of development, where land was occupied, resources were produced and distributed, and then economic growth occurred, and following that, democratic rights emerged. Colonialists from the UK and the Netherlands stepped in and destroyed that natural process, artificially imposing their own borders, laws, and customs on a foreign land. 
And the reason why democracy in Africa failed under side opposition status quo is because we tried to skip to the final stage of that process without letting the state develop organically first. So in the short term, Team England explained how we provide immediate relief from extreme poverty and instability that I'll have to contend with. But in the long term, we also provided a much more sustainable path to democracy and economic development. So we win on opposition's own metric of democracy, but we get there on a path of far less suffering. Vote proposition. Three points of clash in this speech. Firstly, on the principle. Secondly, on the massive immediate harms of their side of the house. And thirdly, on the long term development. What do we claim about the principle? We give you three powerful principle obligations. Firstly, that land and wealth are the correct form of reparations. And recognize here, panel, the importance of this alone from the practical consequences that I'll try to tie in. Because if you have stolen something, if you have stolen, say, my land, even if you have built something on that land that benefits me or my community, that does not make it okay that you have stolen that land from me. And in that case, even when there are practical benefits, we would say that you ought to return what is not yours. But secondly, we told you that this pursuit of land and wealth fits with the will of the people and that land and wealth are necessary to preserve your right to life. How do they engage with this? Two things. First of all, they say that maybe this is true, but dictatorships are really bad and we can't have that. And note that they never really analyze this. And I want to note firstly here, the massive concession that Second Op makes that basically takes out this response because they acknowledge that dictatorships can be effective, that people can have good lives and that you don't need political oh, wow. rights in order to have economic success. But secondly, I'm not just not sure this is the big win that opposition think this is, given, as we pointed out, the failure of democracy under their side of the house. To be clear, their world is filled with dictators, but the difference is that the people in their countries don't have land or money, which means that if there is corruption on both sides of the house, we would much rather be in a world where, you, where at least you are less dependent on a corrupt government because you can produce your own food and you can look after yourself. But thirdly on this, we just don't think that strong dictatorships are as bad as they say. Look at Singapore, a dictatorship where individuals have massive economic power and that is incredibly prosperous. And now we're not trying to tell you, panel, that every African country becomes Singapore. But at the same time, we think it is unfair a proposition to assert that every African country will become North Korea. Finally on this, we want to talk about backsliding. Because it's so much easier to take away political rights than it is economic rights. Because once you have been given this land and this money, that is yours. And you will notice if someone tries to take it away. In comparison, if you slowly erode democratic rights, you are much less likely to realize that. And so you are much less likely to lose the benefits that they claim. They say uh, that if these are they say that if these are that important, uh, then redistributing this land is bad. But this is about choices, panel. We would much rather have Africans have the land that is important to them than some random English or Dutch colonizers. Now, I recognize that this is a free prep, but that is not an excuse for not engaging at all with the analysis that Helen gave. And note the way in here. We say that these principal obligations trump any other rights to democracy or to vote. Let me illustrate this. If you're an individual farmer, you care about feeding yourself and your family. If you're a community, you care about taking control of your natural resources and what was stolen from you. And if you are the states, you care about representing your people's wishes. Given that we prove why this is the principle all three of those levels care about, it's the one that should be prioritized. Before I show why we win on immediate benefits, I'll take up your line. China is currently in the process of committing genocide and Singapore puts you in a cell for being gay. If those are really the countries which opposition wants to champion, then you should really reconsider your stance in this debate. Do we really want to talk about homophobia here, where over half of the countries in the world where being gay is illegal are on the African continent and four African countries still have the death penalty for being gay. We tell you that not all dictatorships are as bad as North Korea and that in fact, you can have many positive benefits, especially when they later transition to democracy. What do opposition say on immediate benefits? They hinge a lot of their rebuttal on saying that these redistributions won't work. And I want to point out that while doing this, they do nothing to explain why their policies will. And given the reality that they don't, we think they fail at their burden. However, we're going to be charitable in our analysis and explain why even if they were able to get these rights, they are still worse than the alternative that we give. They give you four reasons why we think these are, we are not going to succeed. Firstly, the lack of international support. The beauty about these economic reparations is that we don't need international support because you only have to do this in a one-time transfer. Your side requires that continuous monitoring and goodwill, goodwill from the state, which is so much harder. Secondly, on backlash, and their only example and analysis here is look at Zimbabwe. We tell you that Zimbabwe was unique because they were the only country that did this. We think when every country on the continent is trying to implement these, these policies, it is so much harder to have this sort of backlash and have these sorts of sanctions. But even if we do, Myra's explained, well, we don't think that is bad enough to make it not worth it. Thirdly, we get this idea that you're gonna have backlash from the people who you're, who you're reclaiming this land from. 
we point out that these people are massively outnumbered. There were 23,000 Europeans in Kenya in 1945, compared to 5.2 million Kenyans. And it is simply implausible to believe that these people are going to get the UK government to come back and fight for them. By contrast, what we think is much more believable is that the colonial powers would subsidize their citizens leaving so as to avoid them dying in any conflict. That is exactly what the British government did in Kenya. Fourthly, they say that economic and land reparations are complex. We don't necessarily think this is true. We take the land and we give it to community leaders as we set out in our model. And note that we don't need it to be perfect to get all the massive immediate benefits that we give. And I want to flag our mechanisms here, which they never even bother to pay lip service to, about why we're going to be successful. We tell you that we massively outnumber the colonizers, that they have the levers of state, that many countries are doing it, and that colonial powers are likely to support this. So given that all of their rebuttal hinges on them proving that we're unsuccessful, we think we've taken out an enormous amount of their material. Secondly, they say that this isn't going to be enough to give people the help that they need, and it's not going to be enough money. This was clearly a point they wrote before, because it doesn't engage with our model that we are giving people immediate money and a stake in the resources around them. But know that they concede here that money is indeed helpful and is useful. And the problem with their case is that they never contend with how to get it under their side of the house. We would much rather people have some land than no land at all, because they're able to coalesce and use this together in order to get benefits from it. Finally, on this idea that these people are going to turn violent and that the their leaders are going to stoke ethnic conflict. Their own example was of a conflict that happened in a democracy, because when you are scared of another party taking power from you in an election, that is when you stoke ethnic conflict to stop people supporting them. We tell you we're going to allocate these resources well, and that we are able to give people money to solve their immediate issues and restore control over their land. They never engage with that. So recognize the millions of lives and livelihoods that we save, and do not let opposition sacrifice these people for the abstract promise of democracy in the future. What do they claim about the long term? Because their only claim there is that there's going to be less FDI in the future. We point out why sanctions are implausible, and their only response is to say that not all countries will do this, so you don't have to sanction everyone. Panel, the motion assumes that Africa acts as a whole, so at the very least we have to believe that a large substantial number of countries are going to do this, and recognize that other countries are able to invest even if this was the case. We would much rather have better investment once people have control over this land, so then they're able to negotiate. Shell is no longer able to come in and bribe a corrupt government to take control of oil supplies when those oil supplies are owned by the people. We tell you we get much better economic success in the long term and political success in the long term, and they never engage with those mechanisms that Maya gave you. We think we went on the short term, we went on the long term, and we went on the principle. So the wording of this motion may be a mess, but Africa didn't have to be so proud to propose. Thank you. All judges said. Cool. In that case, we thank the third speaker of side proposition and ask the third speaker of side opposition to deliver their speech. Yes, give me one second to set up my timer. Oh, yes. Uh, POIs in chat, please. Panel, the number of multi party systems in African countries increased from five in 1989 to 35 in 1998, while the number of one party states decreased from 29 to two. Malnutrition dropped 22.3% in the last 20 years in the whole of Africa. People living under the poverty line dropped with 10% the last 20 years. Panel. Proposition tries to kill the trend in progress that Africa is, come, is currently on. On the contrast, the economic success on said proposition is unlikely and more civil war is certain. Never been prouder to oppose. In this speech, I'm going to go through four things. Firstly, the principle. Let's say what, what they told you under this principle here. They tell you three things. Firstly, land and wealth, are, uh, are we need to give reparations. Two responses. First of all, this depends on the point whether they're able to give the reparations in the first place. So it's likely that proposition will never even be able to give the reparations due to first argument. So this hinges on a practical, not a principle. 
Second of all, we tell you that they take away rights themselves, right? The right to, sp to, to speak freely, the right to organize are also rights that these people deserve, are also reparations that these people per re re deserve. Especially minority communities won't be able to express their culture under the dictatorship of psych proposition. The second principled line I try to give you is that it's fit with the role of the people, small communal communities. Panel, I think it's extremely weird to characterize the whole Africa of wanting to go back to small communities. We tell you the change under colonial rule. The third layer that they say is that it's good because then people can stay alive. Again, this hinges on the practical, aka this principle falls out of the debate. Now let's engage with the more important things. The second clash is whose policy is most likely to be effectively implemented. Here we gave you three, three main reasons why proposition land for this land redistribution will never work and we give you empirical evidence notes that the world is not black and uh, black and white so the examples we've given you are attempts at implementing props policy yes it was in this in the status quo world but there's just one of those gray areas that did implement the majority of countries did implement social and political rights that is why we're a trend of progress except the countries that implemented props policy so their whole point about oh they can bring examples doesn't work so then what did we bring you on under this clash. Three things. Firstly, they need international support. Promise she tells you, no, they don't. They can just redistribute land themselves. No panel, because sanction will be harming. You need aid to be able to, uh, to bring about uh, agriculture. You need fertilizers to not have all the, uh, all the insects kill your food. You need you need a, a water uh, irrigation system so that the droughts that are in our under continent don't hamper this food security. Yes, you need Western support. Secondly, they we tell you uh, land preparations are zero sum because when I have land, Team England can't have land. On the other hand, political rights are nothing. I'm speaking, they're speaking. It's my speech is it isn't a zero sum thing. They never engage with this point. This means that this is one of the reasons that stand why land redistribution distribution will never work. The third reason we gave you was that it's actively taking land from other people versus giving. There's empirical evidence to show that it's unlikely to be successful. For example, in South Africa, who started their reconstruction and development program in 1994, the largest land redistribution program to date, less than 10% of the redistribution target has been reached by the state. It doesn't work. Note that this alone means the whole proposition case falls because they are never able impl to implement these land redistributions anyways. But look, maybe even if they do a little bit, it is a skill. They are not going to be able to redistribute all land, at best, small parts of their land. The, the, the impacts of redistributing very small part of land never weigh up to the violence that they create, which I will explain in a second. What then do they tell you? No, 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 they'll be able to do this because firstly, they're more African than colonists. Look, if it were by mere numbers, it doesn't work. Like in South Africa, there are many more uh, uh, black people than white, but still the white horror holds power. Only numbers are not a point in politics. It's about who has the resources, the money and the army. They don't have the army. The Western armies are still stronger. Thirdly, they tell you, no, 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 we support a world where African states can learn from each other. Whoa. Not all African states are the same. The fact that it worked in one state doesn't work under the colonizer of, uh, uh, of another state, right? They tell you that they can learn from each other, but the fact that it worked for, for an ex-French colo colony doesn't mean that it works for an ex-English colo colony. The end of this clash, it's clear. Proposition is very unlikely to ever be able to do land distributions in the first place. However, they need they need to deal with the bad things that happen, even if they would be able to achieve land reparations, namely the economic harms we talk about in our second argument. We tell you it will be in, underutilized. For example, in Zimbabwe, two thirds of the population was at risk of starvation during a rain season because the, because the land had been redistributed. Secondly, the, we tell you the lack of FDI is crucial. The stabilization program by the IMF in the Democratic Republic of Congo led to the inflation decline from 8% to 2.5%, which how you FDI is crucial. 
what do they tell you then? No, 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 but we can reduce suffering because they can use uh, like the thousand dollars of cash that we give them right away to uh, alleviate immediate suffering. Note that you finish the thousand dollars in two months after the Africans are as bad off as they were before. However, to sustain policy in the long run, you need institutions which create tax incomes that can sustainably provide for people. That is why on our side of the house, there is more enrollment in secondary education, doubled more from the, from the independence until now, because we create the sustainable institutions that give people a, a, a true improvement on the long run, not just a, 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 a thousand dollar cash influx, that's never enough. Second of all, we, we tell you that the money to invest in the future never work. They don't have the economies of scale to collectively buy things at the point that they didn't have money in the first place. Before I'll move on to my third clash, I'll take that POI. What's more useful to you as someone in extreme poverty? A polling booth in a town three hours away or land that you can now farm to keep you alive? First of all, I've proven to you, you'll never have land to keep you alive. Even if you have land to keep you alive, probably you'll have an oppressive dictator which creates civil war, which brings me onto my third clash, which they never engage with. Why on proposition conflicts would it increase? So this was our third road to victory. What we prove you here is that proposition policy is probably going to stroke conflict. First, first of all, because when citizens have no peaceful means to express their dissatisfaction, they turn to violence. Secondly, authoritarian leaders stoke conflict to maintain control. Look at your notes. This was in LO. We've given examples. What does this mean? Civil and political rights would protect against conflict. Everything you buy about civil conflict being bad in the status quo would be worse. For example, in the Casamance conflict in Senegal, which was a low-level conflict for the independence of the Casamance region, whose population is religiously and ethnically distinct from the rest of Senegal, the only thing that solved this conflict was that the Senegalese president was pressured by the people to sign a treaty with this region. This, this, this prevented mass a mass conflict to escalate further. We've given you the example of how this happened in a Niger radio region, no response. Panel, more civil wars on proposition is a clear win. Vote off. Thank you. Judges all set. Cool. In that case, I thank the third speaker of side opposition and call upon the reply speaker of side opposition to deliver their speech. Yes, thank you. Panel, I think it is unfair for proposition to characterize the entirety of the African continent and the status quo as terrible, because we point to you to examples like Botswana, we point to you to examples like Ghana, where because they were able to enshrine civil and political rights, those were the seeds that eventually allowed democracies to bloom. The fact that, as our third speaker points out, more and more countries are transitioning from multi-party systems to uh, from single-party systems to multi-party systems shows the hope in our world. The status quo may not be perfect, but that wasn't our burden to prove. We don't have to tell you the status quo is good. All we have to prove to you is that on their side, it gets significantly worse. Two questions in my speech. Firstly, on which side is more likely to occur? And secondly, on which side is more important? So on the first question, note that what we proved to you in the, uh, from the very first speech onward is that even if we have fiat on both sides of the house, there are still external factors that make it more unlikely for proposition to achieve their aims. Because in proposition's world, you have to constantly be taking away land from the rich, from the elite. In proposition's world, you don't, you don't have a blueprint because every country is filled with com complex ethnic tensions where, um, where it's very difficult to, to plan things land like land redistribution. The comparative in our world is when it comes to enshrining civil and political rights, these rights are are oftentimes negative rights. You don't need to directly give it to someone. Rather, the absence of the states just not infringing on your right is enough. The fact that you already have blueprints like other democratic institutions and other constitutions make it significantly easier. What does proposition say to this? The first thing they tell us they, is that 
Uh, the first thing they tell us is that they can also have land reforms because leaders on both sides of the house will have good intentions. Panel, I'm sure Robert Mugabe probably had good intentions at the beginning, but the problem is oftentimes when you have no accountability mechanisms, when you cannot vote out leaders, when you cannot protest against leaders, that's when leaders get bad. So even if both sides of the house have good intentions, the problem is when they do mess up, we can hold them accountable, proposition cannot. Then they say, ah, at least we'll have more black individuals. So somehow we will have more equitable land reform. But note that this does doesn't matter. It was also the case in colonial rule that the black was the majority. The difference is uh, your numbers only matter when you have civil and political rights. This was pointed out by our second speaker because numbers only matter when it comes to things like voting. Numbers only matter when it comes to things like protesting. You're not able to do that in proposition side of the house. They have no power whatsoever. I also think it is interesting that the second proposition brings an example of Namibia, where 70% of land is owned by European descendants. Panel, Namibia was one of the few countries that actually actively prioritized land reforms. It was the president that actually had that main goal in mind. What we tell you is it is simply not likely to happen. But moreover then, which side is more important? We tell you, let's take proposition in their best case scenario. Let's say in their best case, you do have economic reform that finally works. You give each individual $1,000. Why is this still not good enough? We told you two things. Firstly, that even if you give individuals land, you cannot use it properly because oftentimes the land that you redistribute, you have to divide it to such small pieces that you just can't live off of that. But more importantly, you don't give people enough sustainable capital to actually use that land, to, con to continue to be able to have, enough, um, to have enough resources to farm off of it year after year. But secondly, we tell you that money doesn't matter if you have poor economic policy. If your country is suffering from hyperinflation, that bag of $1,000 doesn't do anything for these individuals. But thirdly, we told you independent of anything else, you're far more likely to have civil conflict in their world because individuals who do not have their voices heard are more likely to go to extreme ends. What does this mean? It means that for the oppressed, when you cannot protest, you're far more likely to result to things like riots. That when you cannot, do, um, when you cannot express your opinions with democratic institutions, that is when you resort to more violence means. The way off then at the, the, this debate is very simple. In their best case, they may have some sort of economic reform. In their worst case, this is the cost of the, uh, in their worst case, it comes at the cost of oppression. It comes at the cost of terrible economic policy. It comes at the cost of civil conflict. Please vote for opposition. Thank you. Judges all set. Well, in that case, I uh, thank the opposition reply speaker for their speech and call upon the proposition reply speaker to close up this debate for us. Here, here. Can everyone hear me? Political rights don't always equate to prosperity. And that's why when 54 different African states tried to enact side opposition policies, they failed. Because side opposition's policies were always a colonial imposition, an imitation of a system that enslaved this continent for centuries. That's why opposition's case was a mess, but Africa didn't have to be. That's why we're so proud to propose. I'm going to talk about a few things in this speech. First of all, on whether this works. Second, on the principle. And finally, on the practical clash. First, on does this work? Because in response to a POI and third, opposition concede that land is more useful than being able to vote. Their only rebuttal then is to claim that we never get that land. We think we've shown why we've been able to take this land back from a small number of colonizers. But to be clear, this is not all or nothing. If we show that in a large number of cases, we are in fact able to redistribute that land, we provide massive benefit and they've already conceded our case. There are two parts whether this policy can work. First, do the leaders of these nations have incentives to make it happen? And second, is it physically possible for them to do so? On the first question, we prove that these leaders are going to be well-intentioned. We gave you incentive analysis that side opposition completely ignored, explaining why these people are likely to be selfless, to be idealistic, to want to do this. And second, on whether they can carry it out, we point out that the African population had numbers on their side, had the power of the state, that they had all countries doing this so they could back each other when white settlers would leave. And finally, that colonizers would be likely to fund this, to buy this land off them as a sunk cost of decolonization, that as the British paid off, Kenyan settlers because they don't want their people to die. We prove to you, therefore, that we are capable of carrying out this policy. They've already conceded that land is a good and useful thing, and I think we therefore win this debate on that concession alone. But on the principle, because we brought you a three-part principle, explaining first where land and wealth are the correct form of reparations, because this uniquely is what had been stolen from the people of Africa. 
There was no electoral democracy or US style constitution stripped from them. It was the land their families had farmed or lived on for generations. That is what we have to return. And when they talk about how land redistribution is a zero sum game, it's not fair that we're taking it from other people. Panel, we are taking land from white colonizers or elite collaborators who stole it in the first place. The principle of justification is clear. And then we tell you that taking land and wealth and distributing it fits with the will of the people and crucially preserves the right to life and ought to be the most important because that's what you need to access any of opposition political rights. They respond not by engaging with this principle, but by trying to weigh it against an assertion that civil and political rights matter more. But how do we respond to this? First, preemptively, with the second and third parts of our principle because this is what independence campaigners wanted. Democracy doesn't have to look like side opposition's narrow Western view of going to the ballot box every five years. It can look like a huge popular support for a life that was materially different, a new chapter after colonialism. But we also tell you that you need to stay alive to access any of these benefits when side opposition concedes that people need land and money to survive, they concede the debate. But we also prove in our second piece that we get better civil and political rights under our side. And there's no response to this argument than a claim that, oh, this is contingent on your policy working. We've made it clear that this policy does work, the principle stands. Then on the practical, the first thing opposition say here is that we're going to have a dictator. But as we've made it very clear, accepting authoritarian rule is something both sides have to grapple with because opposition have to stand behind the status quo where dictators at some point have had power in all but two countries in Africa. They should have been more careful before making too many critiques of this. But then they only give us two active practical problems, both woefully unanalyzed. I'd like to point out that the rest of their case, which we dealt with earlier, is pure mitigation. First on the lack of FDI. We tell you that the large availability of labor, the purchasing power advantage of cheap currency, and the presence of natural resources, coupled with pressure from Western countries to find new locations for their factories, means that these companies would still likely have invested in these countries. The difference is, as we talked about in second, our workers could have demanded better conditions and better wages. Then they say that people are likely to become violent. I think in the first question I proved why this doesn't happen. What we tell you about unique benefits, unique benefits that side opposition can see when they say there is a high standard of living in China and Saudi Arabia. We tell you four reasons why people don't starve when they have land, why it's such a good thing. We tell you about how we avoid the catastrophe, the catastrophe of civil war. We tell you about how we get long term economic development, but also how we win on opposition's own metrics, because we're the only side that meets the two prerequisites you need for a stable, functioning democracy panel. We win this debate on every count. We're so proud to propose. Thank you very much for that speech. In fact, the debate as a whole, uh, if I'm going to stop recording.